Hey, thanks for joining us here at Faith Online. We hope that you're both challenged and encouraged by today's message. And if you'd like to learn more about who we are as a church and how you can stay connected, head over to faithishere.org right after this video. Underneath our wounds Where our demons have their hold The truth can be exposed There's a strength in letting go I get the privilege today to introduce our guest speaker for you today. He has been with us for the last 10 years, and it's hard to believe he is moving on to Illinois. This will be his last Sunday with us. And I said, Craig, he has blessed us so many times over these years as he's brought the word of God. And uh, what amazing asset he's been to this team as our discipleship pastor. And what a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give Craig, and uh, is Rachel in here today? Where's Rachel yeah. at? And girls, stand up. Girls, Craig, give show him a little love one more time. We've We've been doing that for this last month, but these guys are incredible. And uh, welcome, Pastor Craig. God bless you. Let's just share the word today. Thanks, Pastor. Thanks. All right, good morning. I know I brought a box here. I have just some uh, things that I need to do in just a moment. But first, let me just say this. Um, I just want to thank the body here at Faith Assembly of God, you guys have been such a blessing to me and my family, and I know I speak on behalf of my family, that uh, your love, your encouraging words throughout the years have meant so much. A reception uh, just a couple weeks ago on the gifts and cards, we were, we we're just so grateful uh, for just the relationships that we have with each and every one of you that are here this morning. Uh, thank you for that. I also wanted to make mention just, uh, I think I have a little bit more time this service, so I wanted to make just mention of a couple of people that have just uh, helped us. When we first moved here 10 years ago, it was just kind of brand new to us, uh, moving to Somerville, South Carolina. And um, when we came on staff, uh, there are a few people that just, they have, they've been here for years. And a couple of those were Cindy and Laurel, Laurel Strickland, uh, just uh, loved us, helped us, cared for us, was always there for us, been a great example in ministry for us, and we are so um, thankful for them. And the other one is Karen Urban. I don't know if she's here this service, but she was here first service, uh, pastor's administrator, and um, just an incredible woman and incredible people to serve along with, and especially the staff that is here at Faith Assembly, great staff. Uh, but I'd also like just to thank just publicly this morning uh, just for the opportunity to come and preach on a last Sunday is Pastor Larry and uh, Jeannie for allowing me to come and just preach the word one last Sunday. Uh, your friendship to me has meant so much. Your ministry influence in my life uh, as it has shaped me. Uh, you have shown me what it is to have a missions heart and to love people no matter what. To be a graceful person. And I just thank you for all the times that you may not even have known that you were pouring into my life. Uh, I thank you for that. And I hopefully that my ministry in the days to come will reflect really the heart of faith and the things that have been here and that, that I've learned. So thank you, Pastor. I honor you. Uh, give Pastor a big hand this morning. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> I was thinking about what, what could I give Pastor as a going away present. I know it's not huge, but um, I was digging through my office this week, and I, the big joke in the office, I'll let you in, Pastor writes all his sermons on a yellow piece of paper, a yellow pad. Everybody seen those? And um, I think it's awesome. And so I was digging through my office the other day, and I found a bunch of yellow pads <laughs> that I want to give you um, I tore out all my writings, and so there's still room left. 
there's lots of sermons that can be written on these yellow pads. And then the other thing that I, I found, and I thought, I won't be able to use this where I'm going, but pastor, every time we go out to eat, I, I'll, t- I'll share one little story. <laughs> this is funny. When I first moved here, pastor, uh, he's a, a sports fanatic, and we went to the Somerville football games, and we, w- we would watch A.J. AG, AG Green together. And uh, when, we, when I got there, I, I just love football games. I love buying the hot dogs, the nachos. You know what I'm saying? That's part of the experience. So I'm just like enjoying the night, and I get halfway through my nachos, and I put them under, underneath my, my legs. And about 15 minutes later, pastor says, hey, buddy, you going to eat those nachos? <laughs> I said, no, I'm done. Okay, good. So he grabs them and starts it. And so from then on, we'd go out to eat with some of the staff and so forth. You're always ordering water because we're saving some money, right? Coupons every time. So we have left over, I think it's slightly used, and you'll appreciate this, a coupon book for you that you can have <laughs> as you go out to eat. So, Pastor, this is your gift. Awesome. Yes, sir. And when I come back to visit, um, we'll, we'll, we'll use one of those, right? Yes. Well, it is great to be here this morning just to bring the Word. Isn't the Word of God awesome? Just changes hearts and lives. And so what I want to do just real quick is I just want to take just a moment. We're going to pray and transition this service into what God wants us to hear today. He's going to move in this service, Right? His Holy Spirit's going, already working. He's going to continue to work, and I'm anxious to see what he does with today's service. God, we are so thankful for your love today. We're thankful that your word does not return void, but it is living and it is active for us today. And Lord, whatever we're walking through in life, whatever we're doing in life, I am so thankful that we get the opportunity today to listen to your word, have the opportunity to be transformed, and to live for you. And I pray, Lord, today as we begin to create contrast in the book of Romans and see what that means to each and every one of us, that you would help us, that you would be here in a powerful way. We pray that you would just show up in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we've been on this journey together in the book of Romans, and what an exciting journey that we've been on. But today, we start part three of this series. We've been through the disillusion stage, we've been to the beautiful exchange, and today what we're going to be doing is we're going to begin to create contrast. And so I'm going to take you to the book of Romans, chapter 6, but first let me give you just a little bit of background. Let's reflect for a moment on some things that we've learned. Now I like the book of Romans because sometimes I think that we lose something when we talk about Romans and that Paul wrote a letter, think about this for a moment, Paul sat down 1,958 years ago and wrote a letter so that you and I could hear it today and it still be relevant in our lives. Isn't that awesome? And we're going to read things today that's going to be your life. It's going to communicate to you, but remember, it was written so long ago. And I like the fact that it was a letter. For those of you who are teenagers today, I have to remind you that there weren't Facebook messages, text, emails, phones like, you know, cell phones and stuff like that. We just need to lay that foundation. There were, this is a letter. This is a personal letter. And when you write a personal letter, how many of you remember doing this to your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife? I don't know. Uh, that when you would write them a letter years ago or, or send them a card, you'd spray a little cologne on it. A little perfume on it. So they could just get your... the. <laughs> Hopefully they liked what you were wearing, you know what I'm saying? And you would spray it on there, and, and I don't, anybody do that today? No one would ever admit to that. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. And so, just think about Romans sending you a personal letter, and it is meaningful. It means so much to each and every one of us as he begins to write. So he begins Romans chapter 1, and when Paul is writing, he brings out a couple thoughts. One of the thoughts he brings out is this. He is eagerly awaiting to preach in Rome. And so he sends a letter to the church before he arrives, telling them about how eager he is to come and preach and share the word of God. And he says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of salvation for all mankind. Amen? I'm not ashamed. And then he goes into chapter 2, and we begin to see, even in chapter 1, it begins to take this 
crucial turn because he just he hits the subject head on. He hits sin and what sin is, sin is and how powerful sin is and how it destroys lives. And he even begins to define a few things about what is sin. And he comes to this conclusion, everyone is sinful, Jew and Gentile. Romans chapter 3, he gets to the very end of Romans chapter 3 and he comes to this chilling conclusion, everyone is sinful. And he says it like this, Romans chapter 3, 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now that's a great reminder because that's every one of us in this room really at one time, right? We had fallen short. We have all sinned and fall short of God's glory. There's nothing that we could do on our own selves to get to him what? It was a free gift of salvation. Romans chapter 4, he begins and he uses this great guy named Abraham. Abraham. It says in there in Romans 4 that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Isn't that an incredible thing? He just believed God. He didn't have to earn his way or do anything and it was credited to him as righteousness. He received an incredible gift. And so then we know this is a faith-based relationship that God is unfolding before our very eyes. And it's a, what we would call a beautiful exchange. I change my sinful life, and I get what? God's glory in exchange, right? We go to Romans chapter 5, and he has a powerful truth. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, he says, But God demonstrated his love towards us, in that while we were a sinner, he died for each and every one of us. Isn't that incredibly comforting? That even though we sin, he loves us so much, he'll die for us. And now we're going to begin Romans chapter 6 today. And Romans chapter 6 is going to help us understand that, you know what? He creates contrast. He begins to say, yes, you've been living in sin, but listen, I have a plan for you. But if you will turn your life to what? Righteousness. I'm going to help you understand what's going to happen in your life. So with that, let's stand together, would you please? And let's read Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. The second half of this chapter, beginning in, in 15, is kind of just uh, illustrates the very first part of this chapter. So let's, let's see what it says. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has lied, died, has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he can't die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. To death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin and alive in Christ. Therefore, do not let sin Reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin, for sin shall not be your master because you are not under law but under grace. Amen. You may be seated. Now what does it mean to create contrast? Well, let me kind of give you a definition of contrast and how it's going to help us today. The definition of contrast is the difference between two objects, people, or places. You see, what contrast does is it captures our attention and forces our eyes to focus on the important elements of a design. When you take a snapshot, a picture of someone, and you have someone right in the center of your your picture, and then behind them a little ways, maybe 10 or 15 feet, you see a person, but you see a blurry image. What you have is a clear image and a blurry image, but the incredible thing is it creates this contrast and helps you focus on the important elements of the design. 
Now let me explain it also like this. I, I love this, especially when it comes to nature. If you will take a lotus flower, I don't know if you've ever seen a lotus flower, but it is a beautiful flower that grows in the murky, nasty, dingy, black waters of a pond, a river, or someplace like that. But the incredible thing about a lotus flower is that when it begins to grow, it is this brilliant, brilliant flower on top of this water that is grown, though, in the depths of the murky and the junk. And here's what happens. For three days, that flower will begin to grow under that water. It is all closed up, and on the very third day, it will emerge from the water and begin to sprout and open, and it will be a brilliant white flower, or blue. They have different colors. But isn't it amazing when you look at those three days? Get, get this. With Jesus Christ, guess what he did? He died so that we could have life, right? And so the cool thing is, is that in our life, God does this. He comes into our life, though our life is sinful, though it is junk, though it is is all these unbelievable bad things, I want to say. After a while, when he comes in, he uses the blood of Jesus Christ in our life, and he cleanses us, and he washes us, and we emerge out of the junk of our life, this beautiful, brilliant flower, so to speak. That's what our life represents. That's what he brings to the table. That's what Jesus does. But we can see it in nature. Now also, let me introduce you to this subject. It's sanctification. What is sanctification? Sanctification is the state of proper functioning. To sanctify someone or something is to set it apart for an intended use by its designer. So in other words, we could take a a pen that you're writing with this morning. And that pen is sanctified because it is being intended and used because of the designer said, I want this to write. And that's what you're doing. Your glasses that you wear on your head. They are sanctified because they are being used for its intended use because of the designer had designed that. Now think about it this way. As you think about it theologically or maybe doctrinally, when we are used for the purpose of God, we are sanctified because God has designed us for each and every one of us to have a purpose in life. Aren't you thankful for that? That you have a purpose in life and he wants to sanctify you so that you can meet that purpose intended desire that he has the outcome for your life but all you have to do is obey and sometimes in the obedience it begins to be kind of tough so let me give you just a couple points this morning of what it means to follow and be sanctified we want to create contrast in your life and in my life it requires a couple of things and one of the things it requires is number one is this is that we are dead to sin if you want to follow along in your bulletin in verse 11 it begins to say in the same way Count yourselves dead to sin. To understand Romans 6 and what all we're fleshing out here this morning, you have to realize that the Apostle Paul is driving home a truth. We no longer have the same relationship to sin that we once had. When we give our life to the Lord, things have got to change. Things have got to be different, so to speak. What has happened so often is that we have tried to get somebody saved sometimes without helping them realize that they may be lost. They are trying to get into heaven without realizing that they are in Adam and must be in Christ. I throw out the word Adam because the first representation that we see of sin is in Adam. And so you'll hear that, that language being used that we are in Adam. The original sin is in Adam. And so we are those people who have sinned just like Adam. But we have to get and have a relationship with Christ today. So salvation is not just getting us into heaven, it's getting heaven into us. It's discipleship, it's learning and growing in what the Lord wants. So that is what Paul is bringing out. Because we know this, if we can change the inside of who we are, the outside, the fruit of who we are, will automatically come out. And that's what we're working on. I remember it was late at night one night, and it's probably every parent's not, nightmare to hear your child scream in the middle of the night, Help! Now what I have done, I have somehow been able to train my kids that if they need help in the middle of the night, when they come in the room is to go immediately to their mother and cry out, Mom. I don't know Why? She's the furthest away. They'll walk all the way around the side of the bed to get to mom because they probably know mom's going to be awake where dad may not be awake very much, right? And so 
I remember one night, Callie, my oldest, you could hear almost like a death scream, like something is is majorly wrong. And as a parent, what do you do? You don't go like, you think we should go in? No. I bolted out of bed. I ran into, and she was in the restroom. I ran in there, and she's sitting there, and she's, she's sweating. Her face is red. And I'll never forget what she says, because at that point, Rachel was in there as well. She says, Dad, Mom, Dad, I, I can't see. I can't see. And immediately, we're, we're troubled. We're like, oh my goodness, you can't see. And I don't know why you do this sometimes, but this happened in my life. I immediately went back to Little House on the Prairie where Mary goes blind. <laughs> Everybody remember that episode but me and six others? <laughs> and that fright, I mean, we were frightened. And so you get in there and we begin to just, uh, we don't know what else to do besides at that very moment is to ask questions, but then begin to pray. And so we are praying and we're praying loud. We're praying in tongues, all right? If you know what I'm talking about, we're praying what you call those desperate tongues. I don't know if it's in the Bible, but we are praying. And so my youngest tells me later, yeah, I heard you guys wake up in the middle of the night and heard mom and dad praying in tongues. And she's like, yeah, they've got it covered. I, they're, they're doing okay. So she said she just laid there, not really worried too much about it. Thanks, Cammie. And, um, and so we began to talk to her and we began to share and a- after praying, we begin to ask her just a bunch of questions. You know, what, what have you been doing? What's, what did you eat? What, you know, all those things. And I said, honey, you are so hot. Do you have a fever? And it's like I'm touching her forehead. And, and so finally, I asked her, when Rachel asked her, we said, what do you have your electric blanket set on? Oh, Dad, I, I think it's around seven or eight. What? <laughs> seven or eight. She had, almost, she had given herself a heat, well, I don't know if it's a heat stroke, but you know what I'm saying. She had heated her inner core up so much that it affected the way that she saw, she was dizzy, and all those things. And I said, well, I'm glad Jesus helped you right now, because he better help you. Go unplug that stinking electric blanket. Don't ever turn it past two. I mean, and she would turn it on in summer, I think. She gets so cold, so... Um, just watch your kids with electric blankets. It's, I don't know what else to say on it, right? Thank you, Jesus, for healing my daughter of turning the electric blanket up too high. But, uh, but here's what I'm trying to get the point across is this. Whatever you do to the inside affects the outside. When you begin to transform the inside of your life, the way that God wants you to work and live out your life, guess what? The fruit of that will begin to pour out of your life. And that's what he's looking for. Now let's go to verse 6 because we begin to understand a few things about dying to sin. It says this, For we know that our old self was crucified with him. What does the old self mean? Some people use this, the old man, you may have a translation. It's the old man. I'm sure that's a term familiar to a lot of people, the old man. Who is this old man that the scripture is talking about? Well, it's everything that I was in Adam. That's the old man. But another translation of old man is what we get. We get the word worn out. From a worn out, useless old man, he's no good for anything, right? That's the sinful life. It's no good, useless for anything. It's worn out. It does not work. If you go on into verse 6, it says this, so that our body of sin might be done away with. What does it mean by our body of sin might be done away with? Well, one translation there says this, It's not necessarily that it's done away with, but it is rendered powerless. That your old self doesn't have to have any power over you, but what happens is that we begin to let it. We allow it to come into our life. Every day my flesh beats me up and says, come on, do this, do that. But my spirit says, don't you dare. Anybody ever struggle with that? And so then we begin to say, man, my flesh is pulling and it's tugging against the Spirit. But let me tell you this, sin to a believer is a choice. You choose not to sin. You choose to say, hey, I'm going to be dead to sin and die to sin. So if you're going to die to sin, you need to rid yourself of two things. Number one, and we're just following Scripture here, it's very simple. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, verse 12. Don't let sin be a part of who you are. 
Stop allowing the sinful nature to reign as king in your mortal body. The sinful nature, the Bible says, is a dethroned monarch in your life. And the believer has the responsibility of keeping it from mounting into the throne of their heart. And if you want to get technical, what does sin do to your life? Sin will mess you up, right? I've seen plenty of people that it is messed up. Sin, it remains a plotter against your life, planning your overthrow, because what? The enemy does not like you to fulfill what God wants for your life. It remains an enemy, warring against the law of your mind. It wants to take control of everything that you think and everything that you do. It's a tyrant, and it worries you to death, and it oppresses your life. I mean, if you want to just sum this up, say this, kill sin or sin will kill you. It's a serious thing in your life, but thank God that he has rendered it powerless if you will believe that and act upon that. Now, what does Scripture say? Scripture says this, The life of transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of air by which we gratified, that's a key word, we gratified the cravings of that sinful nature. That sinful old man was continually craving those things and followed its desires and thoughts because thoughts are so important. That life, it died with Christ. The life we lived as sexual, immoral, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, uh, homosexual offenders, thieves, swindlers, that life, that died with Christ. That's what we set aside and said, Lord, I'm dying to this because I am now living for you. I'm trying to create contrast between what my life used to be and now what it should be, right? One of the scriptures that I love, man, I memorized this as a kid. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ, he lives in me now. I have died to sin. I'm alive in Christ. And that's what he's trying to communicate to us. So if you're going to die to sin, the second thing you need to do, do not offer parts of your body to sin. And I like it because it talks about the hands, the feet, the eyes. Everything, the parts of our body, because it's all tied into this body, but don't offer the body. The body is dying. We know that every day, don't we? I can tell that the body's dying. Go look in a mirror. Man, the gray hair is coming. Some of you have Dunlap disease. You know what that is? Your belly's Dunlapped over your jeans. <laughs> I'm on my way. Trying to think about exercising, but that's about all I do is think about it. But the flesh, it's deeply entrenched into this body that we live in our everyday lives. The body is trying, this old man is trying to have power over us, but the Word of God says it doesn't have power over us. That's a truth that we need to grasp this morning. You think it has more power than, you're giving it more power than it has. Jesus said it has been what? It's been rendered, Paul says, he's been, it's been rendered powerless. It has no power over you. That's what he says. And some Christians might say, well, it does over me. Like you're just the exception to the rule, and that's not the case. You're not the exception to the rule. It doesn't have power over you. And you might even say, well, I've been trying to quit smoking, or I've been trying to quit drinking for years, but I just can't. But the Word of God says, yes, you can. And that's what you need to believe about it. You just need to say, yes, I can. Maybe, maybe get in some more familiar terms. Let's see. I've been trying to quit gossiping for years, but I just can't stop. Yes, you can. That's what the Bible says. You can stop. You don't have to do that anymore. Who lied to you and told you that you have a habit in your life that's empowering you? You're listening to the wrong person. That's what the enemy says. You're free. You need to understand that when you give your life to the Lord, you're free. But some people, they can't understand freedom. They feel trapped and enslaved that they can't get out. Now, an amazing thing happened in 1982 on the island of Guam. In 1982, a Japanese soldier came out of the jungle for the first time in 37 years after World War II. 
And he came out and he, and he could not believe that Japan had surrendered for 37 years. He lived in the jungle thinking in his mind that he was still in war, just trying to survive. And the whole time, for 37 years, he was free. Let me ask you a question. During those 37 years, was he free? Yes. At any time, he could have taken a step out of the jungle, 1950 or 59 or 69. He could have stepped out of the jungle. He was completely free. But because he didn't believe it, because he didn't reckon the fact of his freedom to be true, he lived in self-imposed bondage in the jungle for 37 years. Was he free? Yes. Was he free? No. Because he chose to stay in bondage. You see, many Christians today are still living in the jungle of sin. The war is over. Jesus has already fought. He's already won. That war's over. You're free. Right? Now all we have to do is go back and say, Lord, help me. I want to be sanctified. But they live. We live in self-imposed bondage. How foolish it appears from the perspective of people who have never known slavery, yet Christians, a lot of them, choose slavery over freedom Every day. Every day. I I want to remind you this morning that you are the righteousness of God. When you made that step of faith to say, Lord, I want you to come into my life. I want to live for you. I want to follow you all the days of my life. Just like Abraham, who believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Guess what? It is credited to you as righteousness. It does not matter what we've done, the sin that we've committed. What does he do? His blood is so powerful that it washes us as white as snow. And you know what? We have good days and we have bad days. Those great days when we are full of faith and we know that, man, we're doing the right thing. We're following the Lord. We go into work and we're like, yes, I'm going to pray for my fellow people that I work with and You might even go in so full of faith that you're at the water fountain saying that you're wanting to part the water fountain just like Moses did. That you're willing to run into your boss's office and just say, let my people go. On break for five minutes at least, you know. Maybe you're not that bold. And then what happens when we, when we mess up, when the old self, the flesh, rises up in our life and we do something wrong, then we have this self-imposed bondage that we say, you know what, well for the next four weeks to get out of this, I'm going to have to earn my way back to God and then go to church and do all these things. And you know what, we sometimes have to be reminded that we're the righteousness of God. Moses went into the wilderness for how many, how many years? And had a wilderness experience. And sometimes as believers, guess what? We walk into people's life. They are having a wilderness experience. I've had a wilderness experience. And you know what we get to do? We get to go in and bring life. We are the righteousness of God. Creating contrast in my life requires me to be, number two, alive in Christ. i got to die to sin, but then i got to be alive in Christ. What does it mean to be alive in Christ? This is where we create the contrast. This is where sanctification becomes, where we're like, God has a plan and purpose for my life. I have no reason. I should not live in sin. I should be sanctified and walk with the Lord. Amen? I have a direction. I have a purpose. God is designing my life. And if I want to be sanctified, I have to fulfill everything that he has designed me to be and to become. And he begins to do that. And when I do that, I have to realize this. Now that I'm alive in Christ, I must change my behavior accordingly. I have a personal responsibility to live a different life, not like I used to. And Paul is making that distinction there. He's saying, listen, you're dead to sin, you're going to be alive in Christ. There's a difference. And I like how Paul does it because he uses baptism to do that. He graphically depicts through Jesus Christ, what dying to sin. And when we, we, we are baptized, we are dying to sin, saying, hey, the old man, everything is gone. I, I'm going to rise anew and say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. That there is a new person. I, I'm a new creation. The old is gone, is what First Corinthians says, right? I'm a new creation. And that's what he's trying to say. You're a brand new creation. But how do I get there? Well, I have to think differently. 
You must begin to think different. You can't think like a sinner. you got to think what? Like righteousness. It's got to be different from what your formal self was. Sometimes we feel stuck and feel like life is always going to be a certain way and we become bound to certain thought processes and emotional habits. We act out at people, with people, uh, are hurt and anger because of maybe years of just having the same habit and having the same response towards people. But, but what Paul is saying, I want you to think differently. I want you to be now living for me and follow a certain way. So the gospel is about change. It's about transformation. And the greatest change agent that we've ever had is the blood of Jesus Christ. Think about it. I love worship services. I love church. I love hanging out with people. I love all those things. But they know a worship service doesn't necessarily change me. The blood of Jesus changes me. Now I love how he uses a worship service and the Holy Spirit working in our lives, but it is the blood of Jesus that will change your life. When we accept him into our life, when we begin to follow him, that's what changes. So the word begins to help change our hearts, our minds, and then the outflow of our life. If you want your life to change, your mindset needs to change. Romans 12 says, Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to think differently. You have the capacity through the Word of God to create contrast in your life, to grow in sanctification. We want different fruit on the outside, but, but sometimes we don't want to change the inside. Now you say, give me some scripture about this whole mind thing and think of different. Well, let me give it to you. 1 Corinthians 2, 16, it says this. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Isn't that a great promise? You have the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, 5, and 7 in the New American Standard Bible says this. Let this mind be in you. And I love how it says let it. He doesn't force it. you got to accept it. Let this mind. It's a growing process. Let this mind be in you. And Colossians says, set your mind on Christ. That's how we get through this transition from being dead in sin to alive in Christ. We have got to think differently. How does the word help you become alive in Christ? Well, the word of God reveals to us what needs to be transformed and changed. And it does that, the Word of God reveals to us like a mirror. When I begin to read it, and, I, and, and, and the Lord begins to speak to me through this scripture, and he says, listen, that's kind of you. You're, you're living in sin. You need to change. It's a mirror for me. And I begin to change. I just don't read it because it's a cool thing to do. I read it for transformation. And if you're not reading it, you may not be, in trans- you may not be transformed, right? You've got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and that begins to help you. Now, you awaken today, and some of the first thing, one of the first things that you did is you walked to a mirror or a bathroom. Either one's going to be pretty important. And you began to make adjustments. But we have to be careful how we approach the mirror of God's Word. We can come with major extremes, and that's not real helpful. In order to illustrate that, let me, let, let's consider this. Let's consider how a female approaches a mirror and a male approaches a mirror. Ladies, stay with me. Don't, don't write me off. Just listen to the whole thing before you throw any tomatoes this morning. Some ladies, not all, that's my disclaimer, Look at a mirror a certain way, and they approach the mirror. Even in their approach, they go up to a mirror, and they approach it very cautiously. Like it could get them. Like it could jump off the wall and attack them at any moment. And so when they get to the mirror, they lean in. You ever seen the lean in? I've seen it many times. And they begin to look. And sometimes it's very critical. Oh my goodness. They judge hastily. They say, oh my goodness, I see another web of crow's feet on my eyes. And they begin to, you know, they look and they begin to turn sideways. And they, they, they do all of this and they turn to their husband. Does this dress make me look fat? 
Never answer that question. Don't do, you just can't. And they begin to say this, I, I'm, I'm never going to be what I hope to be. They, they look at all of those things and they're very critical and judgmental and it, it just happens quickly. And this is what happens. We approach the word the same way. I'm never going to be spiritual enough. I'm never going to be holy enough. I'm never going to account to anything. God, I, I feel like I'm, I'm living way back here where you want me to be growing way up here. And we approach it in that way. And it's an extreme way to approach the word. Now the male. So a, a male, as they approach the mirror, they get close, but not real close. They may have an odor to them as they approach the mirror. They realize that after years that there's hair growing in places that, that you would never expect hair to grow. They really don't see that because they've never thought that really going to an eye doctor would be important. So they don't see what you see. And so they approach the mirror and they just look at it for a moment, not saying really anything. And then they kind of mumble, that's good enough. And they walk away. That's it. They just walk away. And they begin to say things like, oh... God's grace will cover that. that. Isn't that the way we do life sometimes? Oh, God's grace will cover that. It's not a big deal. We just kind of see it, then we walk on. I think that there is a better way for your future. The Word doesn't reveal to you to bring you under condemnation like the, the female approaching the mirror, right? It comes to bring you a hope and a future. The Word wants to share with you and show you all these good things. We approach the Word a lot like we approach the mirror. We tend to be overcritical or we tend to be a little too loose. And we've got to approach the Word of God with some balance and saying, Lord, what do you want from me? How do you want me to walk through this change? If you change your thoughts, you change your life. The Bible's trying to tell you who you are. It doesn't want, God does not want to keep from you who you are. He wants you to know. He even begins to say, listen, you're a son or daughter of God. You're the apple of my eye. You're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood is what it says. Isn't that awesome? He wants you to know who you are. He believes in you. You are the righteousness of God. He has a plan for your life. And we have got to find that plan. God wants us to. So, so what, it, what the word does, it reveals to us, but it also, the word renews us. And it begins to transform our behavior by renewing us. How does it do that? Romans 12, let's go there again. We're kind of skipping ahead. We're not spending much time there. It says, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will, His perfect, His good, pleasing, perfect will. You see, when you take the word, the renewing of your mind, the word renews us, but if uh, another word that I like there, in the Greek it says renovate. He wants to renovate your mind. He wants to tear out the old junk and replace it with the new. And sometimes when he wants to tear out the old and replace it with the new, you know what we want to do a lot of times? The word says that he needs to renew your mind but oftentimes what happens is we just want to, instead of going in and renovating our, our whole house and tearing out all the junk and the stuff that doesn't belong, the, uh, the moldy walls, the termite damage, you know what we want to do? We want to just rearrange the stuff. And so sometimes we just want to rearrange the sin and we don't want to renew and tear it out of our life. We, can, we just want to live with it for a while and then we don't understand why our life is not changing. Because we've chosen to just rearrange it instead of renovate it you see the bible is god's mind it's taking his mind and it's placing it in ours he wants us to have his mind and so there's a contrast between this and some people are living with this struggle even today is that you're so bound up in fear the fear of life the fear uh, the fearful parts of your life that you think about you you tend to gravitate toward the negative 
And fear is just a natural way of thinking for you. And that's really, fear is a natural fallen state of mind. You don't have to live in fear anymore if you are in Christ. However, I can renovate I can renew and take captive my thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. I can take God thoughts and place them in my mind. And that's what it means to move from fear to having God's mind and moving to faith. And having faith that everything is going to be good. Right? Now here's another one. Well, Here's another thing that we do. We sometimes carry offenses in life. Someone has done something, said something to us. And instead of taking care of, of it and saying, Lord, I don't know what's going on here. Lord, would you take this? I, I call it pulling a frozen. You just have to let it go. <laughs> let it go. With the help and the wisdom of God to say, God, help me forgive this person. Help me move on in my circumstances. And you let it go because what? You think differently now. You're, you're, not dead to, you're, you're trying to be dead to sin and alive in Christ. So you have a different mindset now. You think his thoughts. You're like what God wants you to be, right? And so you move from this offense, when I have the mind of Christ, I begin to put others first. I begin to serve people. I begin to love people because that's what he has called me to. Not to live in what? Fear. Not to live with an offense, but to live for him. Sickness is the same way. If the doctor says it's hopeless, then sometimes we believe it's just hopeless. You may believe the sickness that you have is chronic, but God knows how to bring life out of a desert. God knows how to bring water out of a rock. God knows how to take a sea and part the sea. He is all-powerful. He knows how and what he can do. I don't understand how it's going to happen. I don't understand when it's going to happen. But I know that God has the ability to make it happen. It may not be in my timing, but it is in his timing. And so instead of thinking, I am sick, I am in fear, I'm all these things, guess what? Start to believe that you are healed. That you are, can walk in healing. I believe that God is healed. He's paid for that, right? Rip these thoughts out of your mind and replace them with God's thoughts. Let this mind be in you. I love that. Because God has a plan and he has a purpose for what he wants us to be. And we have got to find what what he wants us to do. I love in verse 14, it begins to talk about that you are going to be, you're either an instrument of sin or you're an instrument of righteousness. That's what the word says. And when you begin to think, man, what what do you mean an instrument of sin, an instrument of righteousness? Are we going to be flute players? Are we going to be harmonica players for the Lord? The clarinet, I mean, what does it mean? That just doesn't have the punch it needs, right? And so when you begin to look in the word, you begin to understand the instrument here in the Greek means weapon of war. You are a weapon of war in sin or you are a weapon of war in righteousness. That you have got to say, I'm dead to Christ, I'm going to be, or dead to sin, I'm alive in Christ, and I'm going to live for him and be an instrument of what? Righteousness. Everything and all that God wants you to be. He has a plan, he has a purpose, and he is trying to develop and encourage you along the way. You're going to be what? You're going to be a weapon of righteousness in your home. You're going to be a weapon of righteousness in your work, at church, everywhere you go. Why? Because you are dead to sin and you become alive in Christ. And he paints that incredible picture for your life. Amen? Amen. Now let me take two more minutes to describe a powerful scripture in Isaiah chapter 55. It shows you so much contrast, and it shows you a way that if you want to remain in sin, this is the way it's going to be. But if you want to be alive in Christ, listen to some of the words it says. Isaiah 55, 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. And let me say today, we're going to be calling on him in just a few moments. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. We're trying to change his thoughts, right? You can can escape that. You can leave that. You can let it go. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. 
Did you know that that scripture, so many times we interpret that as that we will never have his mind, but the scriptures that I read this morning say, I can have his mind. In other words, he wants me to join him and his design and plan for my life, he wants that for your life. You just have to choose to follow him. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So my word that goes out from my mouth It will not return empty me, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Now this is my favorite part. You ready for this? You will go out in joy. Once you make that transition, you will go out in joy. You will be led forth in peace, and the mountains and hills will burst into song before you. And all of the trees of the field will clap their hands. Can you see that? I can see the trees just clapping their hands. Why? Because you've decided to live and go a different direction. Isn't that exciting? The hills and mountains will burst in song. And I like this. Here's the contrast. Instead of the thorn bush, will grow the pine tree. Instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. We have that choice this morning being dead in sin to alive in Christ wouldn't you love for the mountains to burst forth in song in your life the sin that you're struggling with to lay it at the foot of Christ and say Lord I don't want to struggle with that anymore you have that opportunity today because you have a choice you have a choice